All right, so let's take a look at various subconfigurations and look at the assets and issues associated with each one, not just in coverage, volume, and efficiency, but also think about things like placement. Realistically, can it be done? Are there issues with bleed in places we don't want? As well as looking at the frequency response and the way that the coverage changes and at some point, either in this video and future videos, I'll discuss ways to mitigate the uh, coverage issues while maintaining a, a cool sub sound. All right, so let's start with a single dual 18 subwoofer. And we have that sitting here. And that's what I've got. I've got a 24 foot deep stage, 48 wide. It's only one foot high. I'm just using it as a placeholder to show um, where the stage would be and then the sub itself and if we continue on and we look at this in sound vision this is the overhead view at 20 hertz to 100 hertz so a full range of what a sub could be going below and above what most subs will do or are used for and we can see that the coverage is very even throughout the area and then what i did is what I do is I actually look at every sub configuration at each individual frequency. So this is 20 hertz to 20 hertz. This is just that frequency. And what, by doing that, we can look at the frequency response of that sub array. All right, so now we're at 25 hertz. We can see that it's growing. And our stage would be back here. With our stage here, we can see that we have significant energy uh, sent towards the stage area. This is typically undesirable. And the audience is getting as much as the band or artist on stage. Uh, so while the coverage is extremely even, it also has the negative side effect of low end on stage. And there's 32 hertz where these subs have significant output. And again, the audience volume and the stage volume and off to the sides. We also want to take into consideration what is our coverage area for the audience? Is this a field gig? Is this the stage here? And we've got audience members all the way in this area. Now, in this area here, do we have a amphitheater type setup where we've only got about a 90 degree coverage? You know, what is the coverage that we're looking for? And we're noticing that as I go up to 40 hertz, it gets an increase in level, uh, but we're not seeing any change in coverage. It's just rising, and we're starting to see a little narrowing behind at 50 hertz. And at 63, again, the coverage means. So this is very, very smooth throughout the coverage area. Nobody's hearing anything. Nobody else is missing or anyone else is missing. And as we get up to 100 hertz, we see the roll off of the cabinet where it doesn't have a lot of output. But and we're seeing some nodes start to show up due to the physical dimension of the box and the sound traveling around the box this way. It's traveling a longer distance than the sound traveling this way. And therefore, we get a cancellation node. All right. Let's go ahead and look at that exact same setup in Meyer map, which will give us more of a frequency response linearity. It'll, it'll look the same at all frequencies. And um, we'll just go through. And then also Meyer map allows me to check frequencies up to much higher um, it allows me to check much higher frequencies. So here's 20 hertz. I've also, I've taken these screenshots and I've laid them exactly on top of each other so we can actually kind of develop motion and get a feel for what they're doing as I raise frequency. Um, and we can see that it's slowly impacting the coverage width, but out in this area, it's staying very smooth. And let me go back a little bit. I've got some notes in here from when I used this as a, for some seminars. Um, and we are at 80 hertz, 100 hertz, 125, 160, 200, 250. Now, why would I 
want to look at a subwoofer at 250 hertz? What is the purpose of looking at way beyond its limit? Well, if you have a car that only gets to 60 and it cannot get any farther beyond it, it doesn't have any capabilities of reaching beyond that, then when you do go 80 or 70, it's going to either not do it or it's going to be unstable. Having something that's stable, uh, a full octave above or at double what you normally use it. So you have a car that's capable of going 120 miles an hour maximum and you use it at 60 miles an hour and it's still comfortable at 80 when you're passing. Um, the same thing with the sub. If you have a sub that you're using to 60 or 80 hertz, having it able to reproduce 80 or 100 or 120 um, is an asset, but there still is output up there. So the frequencies can be relevant above the crossover frequency, as well as looking at these subarrays. When we're looking at the subarrays, how, how does this various how do the various sub configurations react at these frequencies above crossover point? This will give us information as to how these subarrays are going to sound. If they're starting to fall apart at the extremes, they're going to not have that clear dynamic sound that um, is quite audible. I've toured quite a bit and experimented with many subarrays and found that some do sound way better than others. And I couldn't see the distinct issues in the prediction software until I started looking at the subarrays at frequencies well beyond their crossover point. And then there was a direct correlation between subarrays that sound good and ones that had extended frequency response. All right, so let's move on to the next natural situation where we've gone from one sub to two subs and we've put one per side. Now the advantage of this is it's stereo, we can stack on them. It gets them a little farther away from the artist. So if we have one sub in the center and you have a singer right here, that person is very close to that low frequency source. Here the low frequency sources are physically farther apart. So even if they bleed equally behind, um, we don't have them as close to the source as we did before. And we can look at that. And we do have a summation mode, but there is overall less volume on stage, but there's also less volume out in the front of house. And we see the interaction patterns between the two. And this is at 20 hertz to 100 hertz. So this, these software predictions average all of these frequencies together and give us a pretty picture of the general coverage that we're, we're going to expect. And at 20 hertz in sound vision, 25, 32, 40, 50, 63, 80, and 100. Now, I want to point out something further. I'm going to put the mouse pointer right here. And I'm going to drop down in frequencies. I have to move it to make it visible, at least. Hopefully it stays. And we can see that, let's see, if we go down to 32 hertz, we're going to 32 hertz. We've got a node here. And we can see the cross here of the grid and just to the side of that. As we go up in frequency, we've still got this node right about here. We've still got a dead spot. Here, it's moving inward, but it's still dead right here. And it's moving inward, inward, inward. So this dead spot, let's say right about here, if you happen to be standing right about there, you've got everything between 80 and 50 has got a null. This null has not moved very much. Let's look at these nulls on the side. See how they drastically jump? Now, it's both a good and bad thing. That means that here, you're going to get 63 cycles, but you're not going to get a lot of 80. But then you're back in line with it at 100. You're in line at 63. You're out at 40, but you're, back, you're out at 50, and you're back in 40. So every other third octave, you're hearing frequencies. So even though it's 
comb filtered or it's missing frequencies, there's still going to be low end there. But when you have multiple, when you have a node that throughout two or three, maybe a full octave of frequencies. So let's look at from 32 to 40 to 50 to 63, a full octave from 30 to 60, we've got a dead spot right there. And if we look back, we can see the same thing happens like right about here from 50 hertz to 63 to 80 and almost to 100. Again, we have octave wide holes here just to the left and right of center. This is a concern, and if you've experienced that in real world, where you've just stepped off the mix riser to either side, and there's this base hole that um, is quite noticeable, and you have people standing there, and they just don't get low end like everyone else. You get all the low end frequencies here, you get very few of them here, and then everywhere else you get a different mixture of them. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this same adventure using Meyer Map. Okay, so now this is um, new complexities arrive. And this also, I should mention, even though this is one sub per side, this is also the same or very similar to what we'll see if we had a flown subarray and we were looking down upon that subarray, um, those two flown stacks. They're basically from the horizontal viewpoint of the audience. You have one source per side, like a lot, you have a line array per side. So you get this excellent stereo imaging between the two flown sources, but you also have the side effect of those, that imaging, which is these um, deep nulls. So let's do the same adventure here. And we can see that they're moving closer together. And those dead spots just to the left and right of mix. 63, 80, 100, 160, 200. 250. So I'm going to go through that a little quicker and um, give you a second to read if you want to read this um, note, the notes that I have written there. So now let's go through a little faster. As the frequency increases, you see the uh, nodes moving in and out. We can get an idea of how these two subs are interacting with each other. Doing this type of frequency test and building these um, visuals can help us understand how these arrays work. All right, let's go on to the next. four dual 18 subs per side. Now, this one here is we're going to set up a line of subs on each side. We get a bunch more subs and we can start to see not only what one sub does or two separate sources do, but when we start to form these horizontal line arrays and the advantages with or disadvantages with that. There's us at 20 hertz and it looks similar. Now this same thing would apply to, let's say eight subs aside, if you double stacked. If you increase these vertically, all it's going to do is increase the um, volume level out there in the audience and behind, um, but it won't change the horizontal pattern distinctly. And we can see we still have a lot of bleed on stage. And that's 50 Hertz. 63, 80. Now we're starting to see something interesting. Because of the horizontal arrays, we're seeing a lot of cancellation off to the side, and we're seeing cancellation in here. So now these, this area here is getting a null. You'll notice that mixed position has always stayed 
even throughout all of these various setups. So we can just look, it really stays nice there at the mixed position. And this, I believe, is the fundamental of why so many inferior or flawed subarrays keep getting used for live events, is the engineers hear good subsound. So they just roll with it in 250. So now at 250, we can really see the flaws to this type of setup. We can see that it's extremely beamy. The people on the side don't have any impact. They're going to get the lower frequencies, but not the upper range. And we're seeing that it's so beamy that we have people even in the center that are not getting some of it. And the sound engineers start to get less impact as well. Let's go down. So at 50 hertz, we really start to lose sound off to the side. And this is a very common setup and sub problem that I see for arenas where they have fairly large setups or, and for festivals where these wide arrays on either side, which is not that wide, it's four subs per side, really diminish the low end for these people out here in the audience. Uh, we've got maybe one-third, one-third, and one-third. See, one-third of the people are getting re relatively good sound, and two-thirds are not. In an arena, it's even worse, because the arena, you've got people all the way out here and all the way over here. Um, so having these wide subarrays in the ground can be fairly detrimental. So let's go ahead and we'll, pout, we'll go up through. I like looking at this going at a higher speed. All right, so now let's try and um, not, let's try and start to solve this. We've got this line of subs. We know that it narrows um, and we lost some energy in the center. Let's see what happens if we start to form a subarray across the front. And there's what it would look like with the eight subs across the front 20, 40. 50, 63, 80, 100. Now, look what's happened. We've really just turned this into a laser beam in the front and sacrificed all of the side energy. Front of house engineer is perfectly happy, but everyone else that isn't in this narrow thing. So this is probably one of our least desirable setups. Um, in this range here, we're blasting the people on stage and sacrificing very few venues have such a narrow coverage. So this would not be a desirable setup for um, the artist, audience coverage, and generally only quite good here right in the center. Um, yeah, it's not a, um, a desirable setup. Cool, cool. So this is the first of several videos I'm going to do in a series on subwoofer arrays and configurations and looking at the frequency response. Uh, in upcoming videos, I'll cover arc systems, delayed arc, um, end fire, and other setups that... Um, could be quite useful and try and look at some problem solving for covering the audience in smooth and desirable ways. All right.